talk today about a couple of things that we've been working on in our group, um, and it's to do with microbial co cooperation. So just to give you a little bit of a background about myself, is that I've come from a, a, a maths background, so applied maths background. So I was in the mathematics department about 10, 11 years ago when I moved to Exeter University to biosciences department to set up a lab. And sometimes ignorance is bliss because I wasn't aware of all the pitfalls about setting up a lab. I thought, well, how hard can it be? Um, and we've learned a lot in the last 11 years and we've learned how not to get ripped off by sales rep for buying a, a light bulb for a plate reader for 20 pounds when you can get it for two pounds on Amazon. So that was my first lesson that I've learned. But what we've managed to do in Exeter um, by having a lab is to combine really an interdisciplinary work to develop mathematical models to then use our experiments. We also do um, create synthetic microbial communities. And then we study different questions, um, cooperation metabolism. We perform ecological and evolutionary experiments. Uh, and we've even had a go at constructing our own um, devices to monitor population growth as well. So this is something in progress. So we've done quite a lot being able to actually move from a mathematics department into biology has opened up has caused a lot of st initial stress and challenges, but it's opened up a whole host of opportunities that we wouldn't have had had we stayed in the mathematics department. So just to take you back to actually 2005, when I was starting my first fellowship and was looking for interesting problems to work on, um, Science um, published in 2005 its uh, anniversary issue, so 125th anniversary issue, and it was 125 questions um, for the sort of next decades um, and what we don't know. And one of these questions, um, it was actually named, oh, place is number 93, but it was actually in the top 25 questions. So they haven't listed them in, in order of importance. Um, it was in top 25 questions was how did cooperative behavior evolve? And this is where I got interested in 2005 um, in this question. And shortly afterwards, there was an opportunity to obtain some funding uh, in 2006. EPSRC funded this uh, interdisciplinary network. So having come from a, a modeling background, I thought it was really important to set up a network where we had um, mathematicians who do theorem proof, mathematics and mathematical modelers, experimental evolutionary ecologists, molecular biologists, all under one roof and so to share ideas. And we've had a lot of different conferences. It's actually stopped now, I think 20, 14 must have been the last one. Um, but this is something that it would be great to keep going. We've had lots of different topics at lots of different universities. And there was one um, also about evolution of microbial cooperation as well, where we had lots of interesting speakers come. So this is something that I've been working on for quite a while and really trying to link mathematics and um, microbes to answer these important questions of how cooperative behavior has evolved. So what I'm interested at the moment in is cooperative approach to nutrient acquisition. So a common way that microbes feed is to um, actually secrete um, metabolic products into the environment. And those metabolic products are used then to capture um, and break down nutrients. So this is, they're called public goods because everybody knows they um, benefit everyone in the environment and they're called uh, public goods. So this is a cooperative way to acquire nutrients because once they're out in the environment, they benefit everyone. So public good production is really widespread um, in nature. So these are just a couple of examples. For example, we've got here Magnaporthor rhizi which is a plant fungus and affects rice. And what it does, it secretes an enzyme called invertase that breaks down sucrose, which is the, the biggest sugar storage in plants, into glucose and fructose, which are preferred carbon sources. So this is a picture of a confocal 
microscopy of vegetative hyphae. And we've got M. cherry tagged in vertes um, here as well. And we've got a cytoplasmic GFP expression. And you can see where um, in the Tesla causation around here um, inside, you can see there. There's also Vibrio cholera and chitinase production. So um, you would have Vibrio cholera is secretes an uh, um, extracellular enzyme chitinase, and then is used to digest the primary food source, which is the solid polymer chitin. Um, and then there's other examples as well. We can have of uh, perennial herbs in a rhizosphere. So this is um, uh, what we've got here is that um, a picture that maps distribution of proteases in soil. And those proteases are associated with acquisition of nutrients. So you can see there's many examples where um, metabolic products are secreted and then they're used to obtain nutrients from the environment. So this is just a, a, like a zymogram mapping enzyme activity in the soil, the very last picture here. So, oh, sorry, I need to click on it. So next, so what I'm interested in is the system um, that um, we have actually developed, which is a public good production in Magnaporthal rhizae. So this is the plant fungus, so rice, it infects rice. And what it does, it secretes invertase to break down sucrose into glucose and fructose, and which are the preferred carbon sources. So what we did um, many years ago was um, create a system of cooperators or cheats or invertase product producers and non-producers. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the uh, um, Saccharomyces equivalent system in Saccharomyces um, that you've got invertase producers that secrete sucrose and you've got a SUC2 gene uh, which is the one gene that controls invertase production. And then you knock this gene out and you've got a non-producer and you've got a well-known system of cooperators and treats for studying um, cooperation. So I thought, why don't we do this in Magnaporta as well? Because it's a, a, a pathogen and we've got a host and we can understand a whole host of questions about cooperation inside the host of pathogen cooperation inside the host, rather than just looking at say Saccharomyces. And um, again, this is my naivety. I thought, well, what, all we have to do is knock out invertase gene in Magnaporta, and we've got our system equivalent to um, Saccharomyces. What I didn't realize is that nobody really knew what genes control invertase production in Magnaporta. So I've worked with a colleague who uh, is an expert on Magnaporta rhizae and We've identified a number of potential genes and um, my PhD student, this was his first sort of challenger, first project was to look at these different genes and try to um, knock them out one by one. And we were hoping that one will work. And if it didn't work, then we would have started to knock out combinations of different genes. So we were keeping our fingers crossed and it took about 18 months, but he managed to find a gene and this is, um, G11, which is our wild type that grows on an agar plate uh, full of sucrose. And you can see it grows very well and produces spores. And he identified the gene that when it was knocked out, um, it didn't really grow on sucrose very well. So obviously it wasn't producing invertase. So we were very pleased with that. And this is our cooperative system because public goods are costly to produce, but they benefit everyone um, around them and they can also be exploited by non-producing cells. And this is just classical plot that you can see this is initial frequency of non-producers and the relative heat of non-producers. So when they're well mixed with producers, um, they're actually very fit. So they're exploiting um, the invertase that's produced around them. So this is when you mix um, the non-producer and producers, they do very well in a mixture. So this is just a classical um, definition of a cooperative trait. So what we were interested in is that this, see public good production is very um, widely um, sort of available, but it's a, a flawed strategy because, you know, you produce public goods, they can get lost into, environment, into the environment to be exploited. So the question that interested us was why so many microbes from diverse taxa still acquire nutrients 
by producing public goods. And there's lots of work have been done originally on this question of saying, well, they still produce public goods because somehow they can limit the loss of public goods. So how do you limit the loss? Well, Jeff Gore has done a series of work on Saccharomyces where he actually found that somehow producers don't somehow let all the invitees into the environment. Uh, there's some sort of preferential access that they get and they're able to coexist with non-producers because they even in well-mixed environments because they gain some preferential access, um, access to the um, public good. There's also study that shows that it's actually spatial structure that benefits um, producers um, of public goods. So this is the relative fitness of non-producers. So the non-producer fitness decreases as your facial structure increases. And there's also population demography. So they're saying that if you have um, a low um, population density, you will do better as a producer of public goods than when you have high population density. So this could be an answer because there are ways of holding on to public goods and this is why this strategy is still prevalent. So the first question that we wanted to answer is look at the effects of spatial structure and population demography on public goods production. And the question we had was, does high population density favor producers in structured environments? So there's lots of theory about that. And what does the theory say? Well, the theory says it's, does high population density favor producers when you have spatial structure? And sometimes yes. And that happens if cell use slower than public goods they produce, or if the environment is spatially structured. But some models can actually give the answer no, because you can have close proximity of non-producers to producers in dense populations, and then you can actually have non-producers exploiting producers. So the theory says sometimes yes, sometimes no. However, what we found is all the empirical evidence that we could find is always said no. So there wasn't a single experiment showing that high population density can promote cooperation, public goods production in structured environments. Even though the theory said it should happen sometimes, there was no experimental evidence for it. So we wanted to address that. And we looked at how actually we manipulate spatial structure. We talk about spatial structure a lot and how is that manipulated experimentally? So there are papers that you can say, well, you can change environmental viscosity. So you can have um, thicker agar or what my boots did. So he mixed a food into sort of a gloopy substance. And then he had his um, moth larvae moving very slowly through a, a thicker, thicker um, agar. So through thicker food. So you can manipulate spatial structure through environmental viscosity. You can also do it on 96 well plates where you've got your 96 little wells and then you can have different populations growing in the wells and then at every generation where you're transferring them into the new media, you mix um, contents from different wells and this is how you create spatial structure. You can also just have um, an agar plate and then you can put blobs of mixture of different strains on an agar plate or you can just put them leave them in a flask and they can form a little mats um, and then you've got a spatial structure so what struck us is that there are lots of different experimental ways of changing spatial structure but they're all referred to as structured environments so you've got shaken liquid is well environment but these are all structured environments. So when we're asking the question, in structured environments, does high population density promote cooperation? Well, what structured environments? They're, they're very, very different ones. And when we were looking at all of them, it was very, all of those different examples, they all show that, no, no, you can never have um, cooperation being favored in high density environments. So our experimental system, we now saw because this is easier to do because this is just sort of the middle question we wanted to answer. We do we look at Saccharomyces and again we've got our producers and non-producers that produce um, invitase. They break down sucrose into glucose and fructose. For the purpose of the modeling, we lump glucose and fructose into hexose. So this is just a, 
uh, one component that we've got. And we look at different degrees of spatial structure shape in liquid. Intermediate spatial structure, we've got an agar plate, and then we've got mixed colonies of different producers and non-producers in there, or we separate them into different um, blobs here. So this is a highly spatially structured environment. And we wanted to see with a mathematical model, can we actually obtain conditions under which we will have population density, high population density promoting cooperation, and then see whether we can repeat that experimentally with our system. So this is our model, which um, tracks sucrose concentration in the environment, hexose concentration in the environment, which is uh, fructose and glucose. We've got density of producers and density of non-producers. And what we say is that we've got some rates of sucrose pathway that is then um, converted there, and we've got efficiency of a sucrose pathway, and that's then converted into growth. We've got rate of sucrose hydrolyzation, and then you get your hexose from sucrose, and then we've got the rate of hexose pathway and then efficiency of hexose pathway, which then con converts into the growth. And we've got cost of invertase production. And that's um, it, sorry, so that's it. And then we've got um, diffusion equation here for the actual diffusion through the environment. And then we define the degree of spatial structuring which we basically say that the average fraction of the same type nearest neighbor patches, this is going to be a degree of spatial structure. So on average, what's the fraction of the same type nearest neighbor patches? And we've got this Z component here, which is the number of the same type patches in the nearest neighborhood of patch I, divided by the total number of patches in the nearest neighborhood of the patch I. So this is a very simple way of defining spatial structure. And then it, just to give you an example, when we have high degree of spatial structuring, high DSS means high degree of spatial structuring and low DSS means low degree of spatial structure. So in our model, our initial conditions could be something like this. So we are mimicking the patches on the Nega plate and this has a DSS of 0.5 and this has a DSS of zero. So this is the low degree of spatial structuring and this is a high degree of spatial structuring. So this is very simple. We do 1D simulations, but you can also do uh, all of this in 2D. I'll just present the 1D simulations. So just to remind you, the current theory says high population density sometimes favors producers, sometimes doesn't. Theory says no. So this is what we did. We do low spatial structuring, which is our shaken flask. And then we can see that as the initial density increases, the fitness of producer decreases. So this is what everybody finds. For the intermediate spatial structuring, we get exactly the same, that increasing initial density decreases the fitness of public goods producers. So this is the experiments in the model. And finally, the current theory says that high density promotes cooperation if the environment is sufficiently structured. So if we go from this well made sort of patches that are well mixed, but on the negative plate onto patches that only contains producers and non-producers, so this is a high degree of spatial structure, we get experimentally what the models are saying should be there is that as you increase initial density, the fitness of cooperators or public goods cooperators increases. So by just looking at the sort of the different degrees of spatial structure, it could be that just that the models that were looking for this sort of behavior or the experiments that were looking at the sort of behavior only ever stopped this intermediate spatial structuring and said, well, okay, spatial structuring doesn't do what the models say. But if you go further and sort of manipulate your spatial structure further, you get the result that was predicted by the models. So why can high population density favor cooperation? So the models can help us answer that question as well. So I'm not going to go into the detail of how we sort of played with the models to get this particular hypothesis, but we hypothesize that it's actually public goods cooperators will consume a larger proportion of the resources before they diffuse away if you have um, high population density. And we did an experimental test of this. 
So how do we do this test? So we've got our um, wild type that we think grabs more resources at high population densities um, than at lower um, in these conditions. Can we somehow force that wild type to grab fewer resources? So how do we do that? Well, we created, well, we didn't create, we actually um, taken somebody else's created this, um, a mutant strain. So our wild, oops, sorry, our wild type, our wild type has 20 hexos transporters. But this mutant type, TM6, has only a single transporter. So it won't be able to grab as much resources as the wild type. So the maximal hexose uptake rate of TM6 is 10% of the SUC2 wild type. So if we are correct with our hypothesis, if you compete, if you just put this into the system, this particular mutant, and increase population density, they won't, that won't increase um, the number of cooperators. And this is exactly what happens. As you increase, initial population density. For the wild type, your public good cooperate relative fitness increases. But when you are not allowing them to grab as much resources, you get the opposite, is that initial population density increases, but the fitness of the producers decreases. And this is what the models were saying. And then this is what we went and checked. So we actually provided the first, we really pleased to find the first experimental evidence that high population densities can favor cooperation. And without mathematical models to point us in the right direction, the right experimental design would be really difficult. But also models will help us to understand why we get this particular observation, or at least to provide some hypothesis. So now to go back, um, so we can see how population the, the population density or spatial structure can help producers be maintained in a population. So there's a considerable effort goes into understanding how public goods cooperation can resist cheats. But there is actually a fail-safe alternative that already exists. And it's actually very simple, instead of producing public goods that can be then exploited, you just bring nutrients directly into the cell. And that removes the whole um, problem of public goods production. So why are cells not doing that? Well, it turns out they are already doing that. And this is a really interesting example if you look at Saccharomyces cerevisiae and its metabolism of these saccharides. So this is going to be our system. So Saccharomyces deploys different strategies to metabolize the saccharides, maltose and sucrose. So they have the same molecular formula, but maltose consists of two glucose molecules, while sucrose is of one glucose and one fructose. So to internalize sucrose, you secrete an enzyme, you break it into glucose and fructose, and it's brought into the cell. But maltose is actually directly internalized through maltose transporter. And it's very different and very, you know, the same chemical formula. So Saccharomyces has already solved the problem by having this, but why does he have it for maltose and not for sucrose? Why this sometimes works while you have this, and sometimes you choose to go down the public good production path. So this is, this is what we wanted to understand. There's a fail-safe alternative. Why not deploy that? By, why is not that deployed by more organisms? So this is public metabolism, and we call this private metabolism, because it's uh, fine once you transport maltose into the system, it's degraded inside the cell to, into glucose and fructose. So you're privately degrading it and here you're publicly degrading it. So the drawback of public metabolism is you can have products of public metabolism is lost and then you can have 
population, uh, preventing population from establishing, and also you have low growth rates when population density is low. But we know that private metabolism overcomes this drawback. So what we did is that if you grow Saccharomyces on sucrose, you can see that the growth rate is lower when the density is, initial density is lower than when initial density is higher, but you don't have this. So you don't have this density dependent growth when you grow on maltose, which is a private metabolism. So there's already an advantage at low initial densities here for the um, private metabolism. So this was very interesting. So we thought, okay, how do we uh, unpick this? And how do we really understand when you would go for public versus private metabolism? So to do that, we actually created a synthetic community. So we've got our synthetic community of Saccharomyces strains. So what we have is a public metabolizer, which is our um, strain that secretes invertase. We also have a private metabolizer, which takes up sucrose directly into the cell. And we took this transporter of a fungal plant pathogen, Ustilago mabis, that exactly uses this transporter to take up sucrose so that Ustilago doesn't produce invertase. He uses this transporter to take the sucrose directly into the cell. So we borrowed that transporter and put it into our system. So we've got our private metabolizer. So, um, and then we've got a cheat that doesn't produce invertase. And what we also do, we've sort of fluorescently labeled them. So cheat is in red, public metabolizer is in yellow, and private metabolizer is not colored. Colored. So when we do our experiments, then we can use flow cytometry to decide what proportion of each player is in the community over time. So then what we do, we do pairwise competitions. So we do first public metabolizer and cheats. And as expected, you've got this in, in the system, you've got some sort of, you've got initial frequency of public metabolizers versus fit, relative fitness of public metabolizers. And you can see that cheat can invade when rare. So this is something that um, is, is well documented in this particular Saccharomyces public goods production system. What about if you compete private metabolizer in cheat? Well, private metabolizer wins because cheat requires glucose and fructose in the environment and relies on the public good producers. If that um, strain is not in the environment, Private metabolism, just private metabolizer, just take up all the sucrose and cheat doesn't stand a chance. And finally, if you compete public versus private metabolizers, private metabolizer win as well. So we're thinking now, well, okay, whichever way you look at it, okay, public good producers and cheats can coexist and cheats can invade when rare. So why are organisms going down this route when this strategy? beats everything else. So why is not everyone just using private metabolism? So what we did, we competed the three strains in 96, well, well it's actually 48 well plates, in 48 well plates, and then we transfer them um, after um, every 24 hours into new fresh media diluted. And we wanted to see how they interact. And we've got a little simple mathematical model. We've got the sucrose, hexose, public metabolizer, private metabolizer, and cheat. And again, we've got rate of sucrose pathway, the efficiency of sucrose pathways, then this is contributing to the growth. We've got rate of sucrose hydrolyzation, so sucrose becomes hexose. And then we've got the rate of hexose pathway, and then the efficiency comes in here for the growth. So very simple one. And then we've got the cost of um, invertase um, production. And then we've got some cost of internal invertase because you've got internal invertase that will break internally um, your sucrose. And then we've got some initial conditions and then we've got after different, uh, after growth seasons, then you reset your um, initial conditions and so on. And this is what the model shows. Blue is the private metabolizer, red is a public metabolizer and yellow is a cheat. So if you start with the public and private metabolizers, private metabolizers win. If you start with the three of them, again, private metabolizers win. And if you start with cooperators and cheats, they coexist. But what was interesting is to monitor 
the cell density over time, because these are the seasons, so we are transferring into the new environment, is that even though the private metabolizer wins, the cell density is just gets diluted over time and the population basically just disappears. That doesn't happen when you've got cooperators and treats together, but at certain dilution rates, they disappear. And at the same dilution rates, this population is maintained. And then if you look at population growth of over time, population density over time of treats, private and public metabolizers, public metabolizers, um, pub, uh, private metabolizers have a slower growth. So when they're on their own, they grow slower. So this is our model, and we wanted to see what happens experimentally, and this is exactly what we saw. So we've got our three strains together. The blue private metabolizer dominates and wins, but the population density just declines because well, they're, all, they're, they're very slow growers, so therefore they just get diluted out of the environment. And then if you look at cell densities of either public metabolizer by itself, or public metabolizer in treat, they're maintained at the same dilution rate. So this has led us to postulate that the success of whether you go from a public metabolizer or private metabolizer depends on the environment. So we postulated that the private metabolism may succeed in more stable, non-transient environments. So stable environments, they're not changing quickly. So when prolonged association with the host is needed for nutrient supply. And this is exactly what we see with Eustilagomedis, which is a private metabolizer. And this is um, the sucrose transporter that we've taken from this fungus. It affects corn and requires live plant tissue for proliferation. So it doesn't kill its host. It needs to keep its host alive to proliferate. And the life cycle is about two weeks. On the other hand, public metabolizer, this is the quickest way of gaining nutrients. And we've got our Magnaporto rhizi, which is a public sucrose metabolizer and actually survives in live or dead tissues. So it doesn't really mind if it kills its host and the life cycle is quicker than um, Eustilago. And so that's one um, example. And then you can also have um, other examples that have been looked at, which is, um, siderophore production and these are environments where you really need fast growth so you've got you produce your public goods when you need fast growth and when you need uh, when you have a more stable environment then you will have something like a private metabolism so this is the postulation at the moment and just the acknowledgement so um richard lindsay uh, is a postdoc in my lab at the moment but he has been um, instrumental in this sort of setting up the Magnaporta system. So he did that for his PhD and he continued working on it. And Bogna was my PhD student. She's um, back in Poland doing a postdoc and she was a mathematical modeler on those projects. And finally, Nick Talbot is my collaborator who's introduced us to the uh, Magnaporta system and helped us with all the um, synthetic and molecular work with Magnaporta. Thank you very much. <laughs>